All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens, and we're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, we are going to do a new sutra. Uh, tonight's sutra is the Samidhi Sutta, <clears throat> or the Samidhi Sutra. Um, this is, just so everybody knows, if you've got the big book, we are still going to be reading from the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, and we're going to be, so the sutra that we did last week was also from this collection, but it was from pretty deep in the collection. Tonight, we're going to the beginning of the book, so the first collection, which is the Devata Samyutta. <laughs> So the collection of sutras that have as their theme the this goddess, a, a devata. So the particular sutra that we're reading is, if you have the wisdom publication version, we're on page 97, and this is sutra number 20 of the devata samyutta section. I think there's about 80 or 81 sutras in this first collection. So <clears throat> that's what we're going to read. But we also have a link. Uh, I think Noam put in a link to the same exact sutra. This is a sutra where we do, once again, have a few different versions of it. And <clears throat> yeah. So one of the things that I want to mention, even before we kind of get started officially tonight. <clears throat> so I started, I mentioned this last week, and I want to say a few more things about it. So the sutra that we're reading, it can be found in the Pali language, or it can be found in the Chinese language. And of course, we have English translations of both of these. But here's the thing that I want, I would like to share with everybody, because everybody might not know this. And this is very, very interesting. So what you sort of need to know is that a teaching like the one that we're going to talk about tonight, a tiny little sutra, it's just a couple of pages. And of course, this is the kind of sutra that most people, everybody, agrees yeah this is one of the old ones this is one of the ones that goes definitely goes back sort of to the life of the buddha in that way what's interesting though is is that if the buddha was alive around 500 bc as we think then this teaching or this sutra which originated in in bihar modern the state of bihar but north eastern india this teaching eventually, through a tradition, migrates south to the southern part of India. And it's in the southern part of India that scholars believe that this sutra was put into the Pali language. And then from southern India, it goes down and is preserved in Sri Lanka and maybe over in Thailand. But the thing about it is, is that the Pali version of this, <clears throat> it has a whole history in Southern India. Meanwhile, <laughs> the same teaching has migrated north and has been eventually put into the Sanskrit language. And then in that new language of Sanskrit, this version travels through what we know of as the Silk Road eventually winds up in China in about the 4th or 5th century AD. And so if you do the math, we're approaching about a thousand years after the life of the Buddha that this teaching has made it to China and gets translated from Sanskrit into Chinese. So my point is, is that the Chinese version of this sutra and the Pali version of this sutra they are separated by thousands and thousands of miles, and they are separated by centuries and centuries of no contact. 
my point is, is that as a scholar, like as a historian in that way, when you take a Chinese version of this text and you take a Pali version of this text and you translate them into English, it is unbelievable how close they are. And I tell, I tell everybody this because I know that we have, or I used to have, and you might have it too, it's a sort of skepticism about history. And it has to do with what we kind of call the telephone game. And it's the idea that decade after decade, century after century, they must have been playing the telephone game with these sutras. In other words, that every time they get passed to the next generation, doesn't the next generation sort of tweak it a little bit and change it a little bit and then pass it to the next generation where they change it a little bit? Well, when it comes to Buddhist sutras, all evidence to the contrary, there has there seemingly has been a tremendous effort to preserve the exact order of the lines, the exact order of the questions, everything. And so again, if, if you look at these Chinese and Pali versions, which are so separated, it's incredible how similar they are. Now, I'm not saying they are exactly word for word the same, but it's about ex it's exactly how similar they are that's remarkable. So I just want to kind of follow up last week's conversation about the different translations of this. So tonight I am going to read from the Pali version, but as I was just saying, it makes kind of little difference which version we look at. So, all right. Any questions about that kind of brief little history lesson? Okay. I appreciate you listening. So I decided tonight um, I think we'll see how it goes, but I am going to start by reading. I may read the whole sutra, or I might stop halfway and see how it feels. All right. So, um, um, yeah, I'll read it first, then we'll talk. So here it is, the Samidhi Sutra, or Samidhi Sutta. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagaha in the Hot Springs Park. Then the Venerable Samidhi, having risen at the first blush of dawn, went to the Hot Springs to bathe. Having bathed in the Hot Springs and come back out, he stood in one robe, drying his limbs. Then, when the night had advanced, a certain devata of stunning beauty illuminating the entire hot springs approached the venerable Samidhi. Having approached, she, the devata, stood in the air and addressed the venerable Samidhi in verse, saying, Without having enjoyed, you seek alms, bhikkhu. You don't seek alms after you've enjoyed. First enjoy, bhikkhu, then seek alms. Don't let the time pass you by. To which Samidhi replied, I do not know what the time might be. The time is hidden and cannot be seen. Hence, without enjoying, I seek alms. Don't let the time pass me by. Then the Devata alighted to the, onto the earth and said to the Venerable Samidhi, You've gone forth while still young, Bhikkhu, a lad with black hair endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of your life without having dallied with sensual pleasures. Enjoy human pleasures, Bhikkhu. Do not abandon what is directly visible in order to pursue what takes time. Samidhi replied, 
I have not abandoned what is directly visible, friend, in order to pursue what takes time. I have abandoned what takes time in order to pursue what is directly visible. For the Blessed One, friend, has stated that sensual pleasures are time-consuming, full of suffering, full of despair, and the danger in them is still greater. While this Dharma is directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, applicable, to be personally experienced by the wise. But how is it, Bhikkhu, that the Blessed One has stated that sensual pleasures are time-consuming, full of suffering, full of despair, and that the danger in them is still greater? How is it that this Dharma is directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, applicable to be personally experienced by the wise? Samidhi replied, I'm newly ordained, friend. Not long have I gone forth, just recently come to this dharma and this discipline. I cannot explain it in detail. But the Blessed One, the Arahat, the perfectly enlightened one, is dwelling in Rajagaha in the Hot Springs Park. Approach the Blessed One and ask him about this matter. As he explains it to you, you should remember it. The De Devata replied, It isn't easy for us to approach the Blessed One, Bhikkhu, as he is surrounded by other Devatas of great influence. If you would approach him and ask him about this matter, we will come along too in order to hear the Dharma. Very well, friend, the Venerable Samit, he replied, and then he approached the Blessed One paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and reported his entire discussion with that devata. Adding, if that devata's statement is true, venerable sir, then that devata should be close by. When this was said, that devata said to the venerable Samithi, ask Bhikkhu, ask, for I have arrived. <laughs> And then the Blessed One addressed that Devata in verse saying, Beings who perceive what can be expressed become established on what can be expressed, not fully understanding what can be expressed. They come under the yoke of death. But having fully understood what can be expressed. One does not conceive one who expresses, for that does not exist for those by which others could describe them. If you understand spirit, speak up. And the Devata replied, I do not understand in detail, venerable sir, the meaning of what was stated in brief by the blessed one. Please, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One explain it to me in such a way that I might understand in detail the meaning of what he stated in brief. All right, let's pause there and let's kind of get into it. So that's the beginning of our sutra. And let's begin with, um, actually, let's begin with this. I wanted to mention this. So. This Samidhi, so let's talk about his name really quickly, just to get a feeling for this person. So Samidhi is, you know, one of the bhikkhus. He appears in a number of different sutras. He asks the Buddha questions in different sutras. However, there's a couple of sutras where he's like kind of the main person. And I might read another of those next week. But regardless, this person Samidhi actually has a kind of a backstory. Or it's not really a backstory so much as it's a description of him. And well, first of all, the name Samidhi. So the root of his name is the lat latter part of it, Idhi, 
E D or I D H I, I D D H I. Idhi in Sanskrit would be pronounced ridhi. And the ridhis are these um, spiritual accomplishments in a way, kind of related to the superpowers, so to speak. But a, a ridhi is an achievement, an accomplishment. And so samidhi means. Uh, greatly accomplished, well accomplished, a lot of achievements. So that's his name. But the story about this monk is that basically he was a looker. <laughs> he was like very, very handsome. And so this story about him going to the hot springs and bathing and the Devata coming down. Well, there's another story, or actually, what I want to tell you about is actually this. There's another sutra that uses the exact same introduction. Thus have I heard once the Buddha was in Rajgaha and he was staying at the hot springs. And then in the, in the early morning, Samid, he went, bathed his body. So there's kind of like a stock phrase or a stock paragraph, which is the beginning of the Samidhi Sutra. And then there's a version where the Devata falls in love with Samidhi. And it's sort of a, um, a story about sensual desire in that way. And a lot of the stories and the questions that, re that revolve around Samidhi, they have to do with sort of like amorousness and de sexual desire in that way, because he was this like really good looking person to whom this goddess falls in love. So that's sort of a whole story unto itself. But what I want you to know is that this sutra, the version that we're reading, this basic story, it also appears as part of a Jataka tale. Now, if you don't know those, the Jataka tales are these really old, very early Buddhist stories of the past lives of the Buddha, like so his previous incarnations. And there's, there's well over like three, almost 400 of these stories of the past lives of the Buddha. And so one of these, I have it, uh, it is Jataka tale number 167, if you care to know. And it's basically a version of this same sutra kind of. My point is, is this, so it's, it's clear, at least to someone who is looking at these sutras a little more critically. So I, you know, you know me, if you come to Dharma doors, you know, I do not blindly accept that these are the words of the Buddha. In the Dharma doors, we approach these rather critically in that way. And when I look at the sutras, what I notice, even the the early, early sutras, you, if you study enough of them, you immediately begin to notice these stock phrases that are repeated in different sutras. And what I mean is, is that it seems kind of clear that these sutras are constructed from like these different stock parts in that way. So my point is, is that even the early Pali suttas, they're already part of a literary tradition where, they, where people are kind of constructing these sort of narratives and then putting them in the words of the Buddha. Now, the Buddha might have been the person who originally said the stock phrases, and I'm, I'm willing to go along with that. But what is clear is that later generations have rearranged these stock phrases to kind of create sutras. So I just want you to know that we're kind of dealing with that situation here. So that's the story of Samidhi that he appears in these other places. One quick thing, just a, a, it's a little side note. There's the line, uh, at the, just the opening paragraph, there's the line about having bathed in the hot springs and come back out. Samidhi stood in one robe, drying his limbs. 
So it's actually a, a part of the original vinya. It's part of the original monastic discipline that a monk or a nun was to never be completely nude. So they had their three-part robe. And so even when they were bathing, they were actually just supposed to roll up their undergarment and never sort of reveal themselves. Just want you to know that that's what that line is sort of referring to, is that Samidhi was keeping one robe on, which is the rule. And then we get the Devata, who shining with, you know, such beauty comes. All of these sutras in the opening section of this, of course, deal with Devatas. And, you know, this is sort of one of those sections, this is one of those sections of the canon that a lot of those more kind of conservative Buddhists like to sweep under the rug where they, they don't want the Buddha talking to gods and goddesses. It, like that's Mahayana stuff. <laughs> that's what the Buddha does in Mahayana sutras. But I like to share, of course, that no, the Buddha's talking to devatas and all kinds of people in the early sutras. So it's not a surprise to find a goddess as like a character in the poem. And then we get our initial sort of idea. So the, the goddess, the Devata, she recites a poem or a verse, a gatha, and then Samidhi replies, but then they have the same conversation in prose. And the idea is, is that what you kind of need to know in terms of what the Devata is referring to, traditionally in Indian society, there was a, um, a path of renunciation. But the idea was in a kind of, you know, traditional Indian culture and traditional society, you should fulfill your familiar duties, meaning you get married, you have kids, you have a job. And then after everything is sort of settled, you can actually leave your family and go to, you know, a retreat or go to the woods and do yoga or do meditation, do the, do practice. But the idea was, is that you don't do that until you've fulfilled your dharma in the sense of your familiar social duty. And that's what the, De the Devata is saying. The Devata is saying, you're so young. You're not supposed to renounce the world now. You're supposed to enjoy the world and then renounce it. And the Devata is saying, you've got it all backwards. You're renouncing now. <laughs> like, what's up with that? And that's where we get the beautiful, um, this beautiful line. The Devata says to Samidhi, don't let the time pass you by. Samidhi's response is, no, don't let the time pass me by. And the time is, don't let this opportunity to practice pass me by in that way. So it's a beautiful kind of play of words in that sense. And then we get this really interesting idea. So enjoy, the Devata tells Samidhi, enjoy human sensual pleasures. Do not abandon what is directly visible in order to pursue what takes time. And then Samidhi's response is, I haven't abandoned what is directly visible, friend, in order to pursue what takes time. I've abandoned what takes time in order to pursue what is directly visible. And this idea that we hear about, which is the idea that the Dharma is directly visible. This is a really like, it's a really important idea that you hear a lot of in the Pali suttas. 
You don't quite hear about it as much in the Mahayana sutras, but in the earlier suttas, there is this dialogue, and it's a dialogue sort of about mm, karma in a way, but the dialogue that the Buddha has with a lot of these different yogis or different traditions, it's this idea that that like bur burning off of karma or something, it's the idea that that takes time. And the Buddha actually is against this idea that it takes time to do that. And so the Buddha's sort of thing that he is always saying is, what I'm teaching is immediately realizable right here and right now. That's the whole point is that you, we are not waiting until the next lifetime or some future time. So that's this idea. Now, I don't want to give it away because that's what the Buddha is going to explain more of. But it's that idea that actually the, that what the Buddha is teaching, it's right here. Whereas this idea of like, you know, it's this funny idea of, of um, I, this idea of I've, ab I've abandoned, this is what Samidhi says, that I've, I've abandoned what takes time in order to pursue what is directly visible. And, and that's a, another, um, if you read any of the footnotes on this sutra or anything, like this sutra is playing with the words about time. And so it's actually about this idea of like <clears throat> these worldly pursuits. Yeah, you could, you could read it and understand it as they, it takes time in terms of like, you know, Let's say a, cl a classic example. Let's say that you have this idea that, you know, I don't know whether it's retirement or whether it's getting enough money, but it's this idea that there's going to be a point where I'm going to be able to relax. It's this idea that in the future, once I, you know, get all this figured out, these financial stuff figured out, all of that, it's the idea that in the future, like I'm setting myself up to be comfortable later on. And so there's that idea about what takes time. But it, I think Samidhi is also referring to what eats up our time. That idea of these occupations and, and pursuits in that way of like taking up and eating up our time in that sense. And so Samidhi, again, has this great thing of like, don't, don't let this opportunity pass me by. So that's sort of the theme of the sutra. That's like the overarching question or that idea, uh, or not a question, but it's that idea. Now, one of the things that I want to mention before we go kind of further into the sutra, we always, I, I always want to kind of yeah, I want to make this point when we get to talking about these early suttas. So this is Samidhi, who's a bhikkhu, who's a renunciant, who's a monk. And for the most part, the earlier Buddhist sutras are, of course, much more monastic centric. They're much more focused on the monastic path. And what I want to mention is it's this idea that we're, we're going to be talking about it. We've already started talking about it. And it's this idea about the relationship with sensual pleasures. The point that I want to make about sensual pleasures, I think it's really helpful and healthy to, to kind of think about it as a spectrum. And what I mean by that is, let's say that if we're gonna, if I'm gonna use the visual field here as my spectrum, let's say down at this end is being a celibate, homeless, impoverished monastic. So the old school 
hardcore way of being a Buddhist where it's about absolute renunciation, right? So that's going to the extreme in terms of cutting off all sensuality and also participating in a meditative tradition that is about sensory deprivation. So early Buddhism is about meditations that quote, close the sense doors so that there's no stimuli. And the purpose of this, by the way, is to give the mind a break from stimuli. <laughs> if, if you didn't know, if you haven't heard about it, Buddhism basically thinks that we humans are stimulus junkies. <laughs> we are addicted to stimuli. And an indication of that addiction is called boredom. <laughs> this idea of like, I need more stimuli. This isn't stimulating enough. I need more. Well, that's kind of an indication of this kind of addiction to it. So the early Buddhist approach or solution to that addiction was to just give it up. So again, it was a path of renunciation. And then even the lifestyle was one of having kind of little sensory stimuli in that way to kind of keep it mellow. My point is, is that that's at this end of the spectrum. Then there's that end of the spectrum. <laughs> Down at that end of the spectrum is, is addiction, is uncontrollable craving and suffering as a result of not getting what you want in that way, actually feeling as if you can't even live without X, Y, or Z, that feeling of dependency upon things is all the way down that way. And that's what the Buddha said was ultimately suffering, was that sort of addiction to the stimuli in that way. My point is, is that these early Buddhist sutras and the early Buddhist tradition are suggesting that you go all the way in terms of you're not having a relationship to sensual pleasures at all. For me, as a lay person, as a lay teacher in that way, I think it's important to understand the spectrum <laughs> And to understand sort of where one is at on the spectrum. And basically what I mean is, is that you can do Buddhism. You can be Buddhist. You can do the practice. And there's a way in which we are just trying to develop healthy relationships with sensual pleasures. Now, we don't necessarily have to abandon them completely you might eventually get around to doing that after a while because it'll probably make sense to you. But the idea is, is that I want us to kind of appreciate that there's a way of doing the pr practice where it's just about, in a way, trying to stay on this end of the spectrum and not be so far on that end of the spectrum, if that makes sense. All right, so that's just a, a, a preliminary comment about how to deal with what is ultimately going to be, pre, it's going to be negative on sensual pleasures. So I just want us to be okay with that. All right. So unless there's any questions, comments, answers, or ideas. Yeah, Noam. Um, I think it's a comment, but it may be a question. I it seems like the idea which the Devata is putting forth and the idea of the, the traditions that you were saying that at the time, the tradition was to first, you know, be an adult, uh, you know, get a job, get married, whatever it was, and then pursue a spiritual path is related to what you were just talking about, which is certainly in my life. I did a lot of things before I was like, oh, all this sensual pleasure, while pleasurable in a certain sense, is not as satisfying as I feel like I need my life to be at some point. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> you know, so just I'm sure everyone's had some version of that. For some of us, it happened earlier for some like me quite a bit later. But 
so I guess it's sort of a comment, but a question too. Like, is that is that part of the the deal here? Like, is that why that's you know? I mean, I look at like really young people who are already on the path, and I think, wow, like, how do you even know to be on this path yet? Yeah, like, you know, mm -hmm. kind of surprising to me. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's exactly kind of what this sutra is about. Is about one idea, which the Devata is suggesting, which is like, no, live a little, live a little first, and then renounce. And Samidhi, who's he's hip, he's hip to the Dharma. So he already knows, no, but that's that's not actually pleasure. <laughs> like, oh, you didn't get the memo about the four noble truths? <laughs> that's not actually pleasure. <laughs> so that's where he's ready, he's at that point or has already renounced in that way. So yeah, he's realized that. Yeah, no. Okay, so I sort of have a follow-up. Like, it's not like the Devata. So one way to look at it is the Devata is like, and this is probably a Judeo-Christian way, like tempting him to, you know, like, hey, yeah, why don't you have some, you know, go for fun. <laughs> but another way of looking at it, which is how I'm looking at it, is like, yeah, that you 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 have to live to see that that kind of living isn't really helpful. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I know exactly what you mean. And then, yeah, and then what we're kind of looking at is how it is, would be so advantageous to start early in that way. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I know what I'm talking about, but I have one other idea related to that. But if you do, like if I were to tell, you know, my my son's no longer a teenager. I can talk to him about this. But if he were 17 and I was like, oh, you know, you really should. Like, yep. then, he, then, it, then it would be almost like a, a way of trying to impose some religion on someone versus giving them sound advice. Like yep. in that sense, I feel like you have to live a little and suffer a little, most of us, but maybe this fellow is... <laughs> <laughs> well, and again, what's interesting about this sutra is that, you know, Samidhi is already on board. It's just actually that Samidhi's new to it all. So he's like, I actually can't explain it. Let's go talk to the Buddha. And Noam, what's interesting in terms of what you just said regarding like maybe talking to your own child and like introducing them, what I want us to pay attention to next is... We, I want us to notice the upaya, the expedient means in this sutra. And what I mean by that is it's actually not about samidhi. It's about this devata. And the devata thinks, no, live up life now and then enjoy it. And it's the devata that's about to learn why that isn't actually enjoyment in that way. And so, but what we're going to notice is, is that the Buddha is going to have to adjust the message to fit the Devata's mind. And so that's exactly upaya in that sense. Okay, very cool. So yeah, then let's get to the first poem that I read. Yeah, so here's the first poem. that, And this is the Buddha. These are like the words of the Buddha now. So... We are trying to explain, or the Buddha's explaining, how it is that the Dharma is directly visible here and now. That's sort of the idea of this. And here's the first poem. Again, it goes like this. Beings who perceive what can be expressed become established in what can be expressed. Not fully understanding what can be expressed they come under the yoke of death. But having fully understood what can be expressed, one does not conceive one who expresses, for that does not exist in those, for those by which others could describe them. The last couple lines are really tricky. There's lots of footnotes about how linguistically the last couple lines are tricky, but let's start at the top. So interesting opening lines. Beings who perceive what can be expressed become established in what can be expressed. 
and not fully understanding what can be expressed, they come under the yoke of death. So a couple of things about that. So let's, I'm, I was trying to think of a good example. And here's a good example, I think, of what they're talking about. I, I use this example from time to time. I've never used it. I've never really read the sutra or taught this sutra. So to me, my understanding of this poem is that the Buddha seems to be talking about language, the expressible in that way, but let's take something like this. Here's an interesting idea. An interesting idea is the idea of value. And in particular, I'm thinking about things having monetary value. And then what I'm thinking about is this. So I want us to start thinking about how, let's see, this is, I use this one a lot. So we have this idea, or you might have the idea, and I'm, you can probably appreciate how somebody could have the idea that this is valuable, that this like has value. And more importantly, well, whatever, that it's more valuable than just a rectangular sheet of paper, <laughs> all right? Now, what I want you to kind of know or think about, actually, yeah, I want you to think about how we all kind of know that money and this, we all know that it's made up, right? And what I mean by that is, is that we all just agree that this is valuable in that way. And that's what makes it work is that it's this conventional agreement. But does this actually have value? I don't think so. I don't think it has inherent value in that way. Now, that's one idea. But now let's think about another idea, the idea that your time is worth this, the idea that time has a value and that, I don't know, maybe it's $15 an hour or $20 an hour or whatever, but the idea that time has value. Now I want us to think about the idea of labor having value and this idea that like, let's say that you had, I don't know, I always use the example of an avocado tree. And it's this idea that we might have that avocados are worth money. Another interesting idea, right? That a piece of fruit is valuable, right? That it has a monetary value. Fascinating idea, right? Now imagine somebody had a whole avocado tree. Wow, that would be worth a lot of money, right? And then let's say somebody said, you know what? I'll give you some of these if you climb my tree and pick avocados for an hour for me, right? I'll give you money. Okay. Great. So I climb up, I pick all these avocados, and then I'm now under the idea that that person owes me some money. In other words, they are in debt to me. Oh, so now we have this idea of debt. <laughs> now we have this idea of value and debt. And that person's in debt to me. Okay, I'm sure I could think that. And I hope they think that too. I hope they're under the same impression I'm under that because then I would get paid. My point is what I'm getting at is that this game of value 
and debt and credit and all of that, it's a language game. There is no value. There is no debt. It's a language game that we play with each other. The problem is when I suffer because of the language game. And what I mean by that is, is I climbed your tree. I climbed your tree and I picked those avocados and you told me you were going to pay me X, Y, Z, give me my money. And now there can be conflict and anguish and suffering because of a bunch of words in a way. But we come to, we come to be established in what can be expressed. That's how I understand what the Buddha is talking about is that we play this language game in all kinds of ways, but we can get too established on that and then suffer as a result. Everybody follow me on that example. Now I need to tell you something more technical. <laughs> so within the world of Buddhism, there's a lot of like, uh, I don't know what you would call it, um, yeah, I don't know what you would call this, but I mean, they're references and they're kind of these very implicit references that if you're not, if you're not really tuned into like Dharma Sutra study stuff, you could miss it. And what it is, is that when the Buddha talks about what is expressible, he is actually most often talking about the five aggregates. The five aggregates, which is to say the body of physical form, the senses of your sensory organs, you, the perception, conditioning, and consciousness, those five aggregates are what are expressible about the sentient subject. It's about what is expressible about what's going on here. The self like that singular idea of me? <clears throat> nope, there, there's not that. But there is these five aggregates. Now, if we understand that, if we understand that the expressible is sort of standing in for this Buddhist teaching of the five aggregates, then we could read it as beings who perceive what is expressible become established in what can be expressed hmm. not fully understanding the aggregates not fully understanding what can be expressed they come under the yoke of death now really quickly i just do want you to know if you were to read the poly version of this i just want you to know this is a little anecdote it's a little aside when it says that at the end that this whoever gets established on the expressible and doesn't understand they they fall under the yoke of death i just want you to know that the word that is being translated is yoga <laughs> they become yoga yogam with death and that's that technical or uh, I guess it would be the literal use of the word yoga in Sanskrit to mean a kind of yoking, or if you've ever seen a ox or a mule who is pulling a cart, the thing around their neck that keeps them attached to the cart, that's the yoke. And we get the English word yoke from the Sanskrit word yoga. So they're not referring to, you know, sun salutations, yoga. They're talking about being yoked by death if, and this is where I want to get to, uh, yeah, I definitely want to get to the second stanza. So not, again, the first stanza tells us not fully understanding the five aggregates, they come under the yoke of death. Now. 
but having fully understood what can be expressed. So one who has fully understood the five aggregates, that one, that one does not conceive one who expresses. So really quickly, just to put it in like, like my language, what they're talking about there is the unenlightened thinks and says, I'm speaking. The enlightened mind knows there is speaking happening. To recognize that there is speaking happening is different than to say, I'm speaking. I'm speaking is what the Buddhists call the conceit of self. This presumption that there is somebody doing this rather than that it is happening. And there is a big difference between understanding that something is happening versus thinking that somebody is doing something. And so that's how I understand what the Buddha means when he says, but having fully understand what can be expressed, one does not conceive one who expresses. And then the last part of that poem is this, it's very complicated language, especially if you're trying to keep it gender neutral, where it's, it's about one who fully understands what is expressible, one who fully understands the aggregates. That one does not conceive the one who expresses, and therefore there's no there's no way to describe that. Meaning the one that idea of not conceiving the one who expresses. So if somebody's in that mode, there's no way to describe them. Let me give you an example. <laughs> so I've, I've mentioned this one a long time ago. I used to go through this a lot more. I haven't gone through it in a while. So I want you, or this would be my way of understanding this. So it's about this idea of identifying with, and now we could talk about a lot of different things, but what I'm thinking about is the idea of say, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we can identify. We could identify with our name. Hi, right, I'm Michael. Except I could go change my name. I could legally go change my name to something else entirely. And then I would be called that. Therefore, I'm not inherently Michael, although I could identify with that name, I could identify with a new name. You know, it's another way to identify is with family. So that's identifying with our last name. And that's a little different than identifying with our first name. But if you were an early Buddhist, you would be asked to renounce your family name. You would actually be asked to renounce family ties, cut off family ties. And then you wouldn't be of that clan or of that family anymore. Many people identify with their occupation and they might even say, I'm a doctor or I'm an architect. And I want you to notice the language there, like I am an architect. <laughs> It's this I, like existential statement about what I am, right? Now, the thing about it that is, is that when one is architecting, when one is architecting, then one is an architect. But the problem is, is when you get fired and you are no longer architecting, meaning you're no longer an architect, and yet your identity is so synonymous with being an architect, that can cause existential anxiety 
when you are so identified with your job and then you lose your job, but you identify with that occupation. And so there's a sense of like, ah, but then you might get a new job as something else. And so are you inherently a doctor or an architect? Are you inherently this new job? Or is it sort of a choice to identify with occupation? My point is, oh, this is another one. So I identify as a married person, but I could get divorced and then I would no longer be married. So I am not inherently married or not. What I'm getting at is, is that all of these identifications, identifying with name, family, occupation, body, all of these, what we want to notice is that the things that we are identifying with are not inherent. They are totally shiftable in the ways that I've just been talking about. That You can change your name, you can change your occupation, you can change your marital status, you can change your sex, you can change your gender, you can change all of these things. So they are not fixed. But what we want to notice is the mind that can identify with them. And that's where you start to get the idea of I am, the conceit, I am. I am an architect called this. I am the married architect called this. Notice the construction of identity. Notice the construction of a sense of self, which is all of those identifiers put together. All of those identifiers that I just mentioned, by the way, are more aspects of the language game of culture and society, which is to say that this is a cultural thing that we understand together, but it has no inherentness to it. It's a convention in that sense. Names are conventional. All of these things are conventional. So, what I like to talk about when it comes to Buddhism is, yeah, you could identify as being, say, a doctor, and then when you stop being a doctor, you then get a new job as an architect, and now you're identifying as an architect, or identifying as married, and then identifying as being divorced. What I like to think about in terms of the Dharma is not identifying at all. And that sort of actually can puzzle the mind a little bit because no, 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 no. No, 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 I'm either married or single. And I guess divorced, which is a special category of singleness, right? So the idea is, is like, no, 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 I'm either married or single. And I want you to notice that that is the mind, that is the self that is desperately clinging or trying to cling to something for identity. And what we want to think about and possibly even do is not identify. What would that be like to just not identify with either of them and to ultimately not identify? as Michael, nor as anybody else, in a way. What I'm getting at, what I hope I've gotten at, is the idea of someone who has successfully stopped identifying. What could you say about them? How, how could you delineate them? <laughs> That's what, uh, that's how I understand the last two lines of the second stanza. In turn, and they are, by the way, if you, if, if you didn't know, they are describing an arahat in that tradition. An arahat is one who fully understands what can be expressed and does not conceive the idea of one who expresses. That's an arahat. 
And the idea is, is that an arhat is in that state of not identifying with anything in that way. And then that puts the arhat in this indescribable category in that sense. All right, questions, comments, answers, ideas about all of that. And that actually, so the gnome's comment was accept identifying as an arhat. And actually they wouldn't even do that. It would be others who identify them as that. But a good arhat would not even a, a, a do that. Yeah, Izzy. Oh, oh we got to unmute you though. It's coming. Hey. There you go. Uh, thanks. Um, I, God, I hope I can get my brain to words in a comprehensible way right now. But um, I, I'm curious about like in, in this like concept of like not identifying with anything at all, including like, like what you said specifically that jumped out at me was like, it's not that I am speaking. It's that I'm like noticing that there is speaking happening. I'm, I guess I'm just like curious about and like grappling with like how to connect that with like, like for me, recovery is what brings me to like, you know, to this kind of space, like recovery, Dharma meetings and all of that. And so my interest in Buddhism is very entwined with like a desire to be taking more responsibility for like how my actions are impacting, you know, myself and the people around me and all of that. And so I, yeah, I guess I'm just curious, like, I feel like totally there's got to be some way to like hold both of those things together and I'm I'm curious for any insight on like how to do that totally yeah so let me definitely say more about this idea of not identifying let me just in order to answer Izzy's question as well as I can I want to change the language just a little bit and what it is is it's related to the idea of identifying as, it's very, very related. I just wanna change the grammar language a little bit. So what it is, we wanna pay attention in Buddhism, we wanna pay attention of course to clinging. The idea is, is that we understand kind of implicitly from a basic Dharmic perspective that we understand implicitly that there's something wrong with clinging. <laughs> like, and again, from the Four Noble Truths point of view, we understand that it's a source of suffering, that it's actually holding on too tight is what is kind of causing all of the suffering in a way. So rather than talking about identifying, I want to re I want to use the language of appropriating. And what I mean by that is. In the Buddhist world, what we talk a lot about, we talk a lot about the idea that we can think in such a way that we would say, I have hands. And when we say that, what we notice is that there's a me that has hands. And what that means is, is that you are not your hands, you have hands, or at least that's the way you're thinking about it. Now, the idea is, is that that's the same way in which we would say that I have a body, I have eyes, I have ears. And then this is where the Buddha goes, all right, what's this I that has hands and has a body? Like, where is it? What is it? And what the Buddha sort of realized is, oh, there isn't that self, but the sense of that self arises from the appropriating, because the act of appropriating gives rise to the sense that there must be somebody there doing that. And now, Izzy, where I'm, what I'm getting at in the long run is that in addition to appropriating the body, we extend that and we talk about my stuff. And so we appropriate things in terms of ownership. But then the problem is, is that if somebody comes along and 
takes, you know, I don't know, let's say I had this cup of tea and I was really enjoying this cup of tea and then somebody runs off with my cup of tea, I can get as angry as if they had just run off with my own hand, right? I feel that offended. I feel that trespassed upon. But we want to notice that it's about the appropriating in that way. Now, we can appropriate occupation. We can appropriate all of these things. I can appropriate my spouse, my house, my car. And all of that is constructing this self that has a car, that has a spouse, that has a name, all of those things. Now, Izzy, what I wanted to get back around to in terms of your question, what we want to notice is that there's this, which is like the idea that this is my cup. It's mine. And then I can do this with it. But what's so interesting is that I, I renounce the cup. I renounce it. It's not mine anymore. Come and get it. It's not mine. But look, it works the same. It, fu it functions the same. The only thing that's now missing is this delusion of my cup. And it never was my cup. That was always just sort of an impression I was under. So the idea is, is it's about this sort of what the Buddhists call this middle path. And this middle path is this very gentle, delicate place, or I consider it a gentle, delicate place, where we are not clinging desperately to things, but we are also not rejecting them outright. It is more of this, again, gentle kind of middle path that looks more like this, and less like this, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And it's just a difference in disposition in that way. So I don't know if that really said anything, but it probably rearranged some ideas. So cool. <laughs> All right. Shall we continue? Because because if we remember from my opening reading, when I read this at the beginning, <laughs> this first poem or these first two stanzas, our Devata did not understand. They were whoop, over the Devata's head. So this is where, again, the Buddha said, so if you understand, spirit, speak up. And the Devata said, I don't understand. Could you put it a different way in that sense? Could you explain it to me in such a way that I might understand? This is the Buddha's second version of the teaching. So in verse, the Buddha says, one who conceives, I am equal, I am better, I am worse, might on that account engage in disputes but one not shaken in these three dimensions or these three discriminations does not think I am equal or better or worse. If you understand spirit, speak up. And the Devata said in this case too, venerable, I do not understand in detail the meaning of what was stated in brief by the blessed one. Let the blessed one explain it to me in such a way that I might understand in detail the meaning of what he stated in brief. So I want to address, I, 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 I already know, I, I already feel a certain, you know, disease, which is this idea of the idea that I am equal. I think as good Buddhists, we can recognize the problem with thinking I am better than you or better than other people. And we could probably even understand the problem with thinking I am worse than other people. But isn't it, wouldn't it be a good thing to say that I am equal? 
Well, not from the place that we're talking about here tonight, where we're really trying to avoid this idea of I am anything. And so we want to notice that reifying the self as being equal to doesn't actually deal with the root cause of the problem. And what we really want to notice about the wisdom of this poem, it's a poem about contentiousness, about argumentation and fighting, or this little one. And so it's this idea that one who thinks that they are better than, equal to, or worse, they might on that account engage in dispute. But one who's not even playing that game, who's not shaken by those three things, they do not think that I am equal to, better than, or worse. Again, I would really just want you to sort of like, just try on, try on the mentality of not better than, not equal, or not worse. I want you to notice that there's not a lot of room for argument in there. Whereas if I think I'm better than you, oh, there's an argument to be had now, right? If I think I'm worse than you, there's an argument to be had. And even in terms of the equality, there is an argument to be had in terms of you are not equal to me. But notice again, and we want to remember the first verse, we want to remember the first stanza about one that doesn't play the language game in that sense. But the Buddha just took it one kind of notch lower by just talking in terms of not thinking that one is better than, worse, or equal to. But once again, the Devata didn't quite get it. So if everybody's good with that, cool. So then the Buddha gives his third and final stanza. Um, and I am going to change the, if you're reading from this one, I'm changing it just a little bit, but it says, by abandoning reckoning and not assuming conceit, one cuts off craving here and now for name and form. Though devas and humans search far and wide, here and beyond, in the heavens and all abodes, they do not find the one whose knots are cut, the one untroubled, free of longing. If you understand, spirit, speak up. And the devata said, I understand in detail, venerable sir, the meaning of what was stated in brief by the Blessed One. So, a couple of things going on in there, but so abandoning reckoning and not assuming conceit. Well, the second part of that, not assuming conceit, is what we've been talking about. It's this idea of there is speaking happening, but not I am speaking which is exactly like there is a cup being used to drink. It's not my cup. It's the same idea. So there can be speaking in that sense. So that's the idea of abandoning conceit. It's this, the conceit of self. Abandoning reckoning though, we need to sort of understand that from a certain Buddhist point of view, there's one way of thinking. They're going to call it reckoning. It gets translated a bunch of different ways, but the basic idea of what is being translated as reckoning or in a way just quote thinking, it's this idea of there being somebody thinking about something. And that idea that there is somebody think, thinking about something, well, that's what we call thinking. That's what we call reckoning. But we, what we want to notice is, is that thinking of thinking that way <laughs> is, again, prob 
problematic from this Buddhist point of view, which is, well, like I was saying in terms of there is speaking happening, but I can deludedly think I am speaking. Likewise, there is thinking happening, but I could be deluded into saying I am thinking. From a Buddhist point of view, we are not thinking. Thoughts are sort of being experienced. <laughs> but we have the delusion of agency in that, in the idea that, no, no, I'm making the thoughts. And it's like, really? Have you ever looked closely at your thinking <laughs> and noticed that the ideas just bubble up? And you don't actually have control over the thinking that you actually are just a passive observer of the movie of your life in a way, so to speak. So the Buddha here is talking about abandoning that kind of thinking, abandoning reckoning, and not assuming conceit. By doing that, one cuts off craving here for nama rupa for name and form so this sutra although you might not have noticed it or you, you might have might you could miss it this sutra is actually about nama rupa it's actually about name and form that i mean in terms of categorizing this sutra, that's the teaching that it would kind of fall under. Is And I think next week we're going to do another name and form sutra. So really quickly, we've talked about Nama Rupa a few times in Dharma Doors, and it's a very complicated idea that I just need to say a few things about. You have probably heard me talk about nama rupa which is translated as name and form you've probably heard me talk about it in terms of language which is that nama rupa is about the labels that we put on shapes and nama rupa is an interesting thing about language which is the inextricability of those two ideas. And what I mean by that is, is that you can't actually really conceive of a shape without having a kind of name for the shape in mind. It's this interesting thing about language that the Buddha talks about. What you need to know though, which is something that I wouldn't maybe have mentioned lately, in the early Buddhist tradition that this sutra is coming from, Nama Rupa is what we in the West call the mind-body complex. So traditionally, Nama Rupa actually referred to um, Namas, which was mentation, and Rupa, which is the physical body. So nama rupa is sort of code for the five skandhas, where rupa is rupa, and sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness all fall under the category of namas. And therefore, nama rupa is both the mental aspect of being you and the physical aspect of being you. Now, what's interesting about this, by the way, is that thinking about nama rupa as referring to the sentient agent, referring to the quote self, it actually is in, it's in perfect alignment with the other way that I teach nama rupa about language and shapes. It's, it's, this, it's this funny idea that I am Michael shaped. And you, you probably don't think that I am Noam. You probably don't think that I'm Noe. You don't think that I'm these other SFDC people. Why? Because I'm not shaped like they are. I'm shaped like Michael. 
But what is that? <laughs> what is Michael? Oh, the, the one shaped like this. So Nama Rupa is always a kind of endless feedback loop in that way. My point is though, in this poem, when the Buddha says that the one who abandons reckoning and does not assume conceit, they cut off craving here for Nama Rupa. In other words, they cut off craving for the five skandhas. And craving the five skandhas, craving the five skandhas is about how am I looking? Do I look good? Am I looking my best? That is being not just attached to the skandhas, but being sort of clinging to them in that way, which is about I, the, the idea that I can only be happy if the physical body is looking good. And that shows this sort of attachment and clinging to the skandhas. And the Buddha, of course, will say that the problem with that is you know it's, a, it's deteriorating, right? <laughs> you know that's a losing battle, right? In terms of trying to get your pleasure from the body looking good. Yeah, good luck with that. There's a greater pleasure, though, which is to not identify with that. To be totally cool with however the body looks because I am not the body in that way. So that's one aspect of not clinging to Nama Rupa. But let's go back to the Buddha's first poem, or the, yeah, the first stanza about coming under the yoke of death. And what the Buddha's sort of, what I would interpret the Buddha's message as is that clinging to the five skandhas is what creates the fear of dying. Because if you think you are the physical body in that way, I've got bad news for you. But if you don't identify with the impermanent decaying body, I've got great news. I've totally, I've got really good news for you regarding suffering and the lack of it. So, <laughs> all right, everybody doing good with that part. And now the last part of the Buddha's poem. Though devas and humans search here and beyond in the heavens and all abodes, they do not find the one whose knots are cut, the one untroubled, free of longing. So once again, I, I, I don't think I've seen uh, commentators reference this, um, at least what that is a reference to. So we read a sutra. It was a sutra, a Mahayana sutra that we read not too long ago. And it actually brought up the story. And the story is, is that right after the Buddha gets enlightened and he's seated under the Bodhi tree, he's in this enlightened state. And there's all these devas. And the devas for different reasons, but the devas want to see the Buddha. They want to go either pay homage to the Buddha or they want to see the Buddha. And so they go looking in the realm of desire and they don't see the Buddha anywhere. So they go into the realm of form where the, the, the dhyana meditators are and they don't see the Buddha. So he must be in the formless realm and there's special devas that can go into the formless realm and they go in there and they can't find the Buddha there either. And this is completely, it completely blows the devas away. And the idea is, is that the fully enlightened Buddha is not in any of the three realms. And why would that be? Because of having cut off this conceit of self in that way. And what we want to notice is, is that an enlightened being, whether it be an arahat or the Buddha, by virtue of not having that identity of self, what are we looking for? What are the devas looking for? 
what could there be in the realm of desire or the realm of form or even the formless realm in that way? So this, by the way, this idea that, they, that the devas couldn't find the Buddha anywhere, it speaks to why and how the Buddha, who's, you know, by all, by most accounts, just a human, just a regular person in that way, the idea that the Buddha got to a point where the devas couldn't find him anywhere, it actually is how and why the gods come and bow to the Buddha. This is like unprecedented, truly unprecedented world on and one, as far as this idea that the Buddha has reached a state that even the gods are in awe of. It's a big statement, especially coming from a culture where the gods are big in, in that way, like very worthy of reverence, very much greater than humans, but not in, as far as it pertains to the Buddha. So that's that idea of, of the devas and humans search for him here and beyond in the heavens and all abodes. They do not find the one whose knots are cut. And then again, I want to come back to like, so that we don't lose the point here. Like we get too carried away. The one untroubled, free of longing. So I don't want to miss that what we're going for here is peace, <laughs> tranquility, joy. <laughs> like these ideas, this idea of not being troubled, not longing this idea of contentment, all of these things. And before I miss my opportunity here, that's what the Buddha says is immediately available right here and right now. You can put down the burden at any moment. That's what the Dharma, is. that's what the message of the Dharma is. That's what Samiti was trying to tell the Devata, but couldn't quite explain it. It's this idea that at any moment, we can put it down and there will not be suffering. And the Buddha says that it is right here. It's an ever present possibility. And that is a very, very different message than if you get busy now and really start working on it, in 20 years, you too could be content. <laughs> that's a different message. And that's what the Devata is like. No, don't put off what is immediately available for what takes time. The Buddha's method does not take time in that way. So, and it also doesn't take time <laughs> in, in the other sense of it. And just for good measure, once again, the Devata says, yes, I understand in detail, venerable sir. And then the Devata recites this concluding verse. One should do no evil in all the world, not by speech, mind, or body. Having abandoned sense pleasures, mindful and clearly comprehending, one should not pursue a course that is painful and harmful. And by the way, that last remark about one should not pursue a path that is painful or harmful, that is the Buddha's statement about any form of self-mortification, um, severe fasting, sleep deprivation, that is not the path. That's when the Buddha talks about this is not a path of self-mortification or self-pleasure, it's the middle path. We need to understand that there are some ascetic traditions that do practice these kind of <clears throat> self-mortification practices, and Buddhism has never been into them. So just wanted to make that clear about that last line. And on that note, that's going to conclude the Samidhi Sutra.
Thank you all. Oh, thank you. We did it all. Yay. Mm-hmm. <laughs>